Welcome to this week's episode of Startups for the Rest of Us. I'm Rob Walling. I'm your host today, and I'm excited to have Josh Pigford back on the show. And we run through listener questions covering topics like annual pay increases, should my B2B SaaS write a blog post about our price increase, whether offering discounted plans in exchange for people to have your Powered by Link or your branding is a good idea, find a good start of people, and all kinds of other stuff. We actually chat about Josh's new effort, which is called Maybe at maybe.co. I'm pretty excited for him. You'll hear me bust his chops about getting started with something so soon. Before we dive into our questions, Startups for the Rest of Us has 905 ratings across 47 countries. Our most recent is from Daboom1234. Title is Gateway Drug for Starting a Company. This podcast inspired me to start my own company and changed my life for the better. Awesome. Love to hear it. If you want to give us a rating or a review, log into your podcatcher, give us five stars. Really appreciate it. And that'll help me get to the 1,000 rating mark that I am trying to achieve by some unknown date. But I definitely would appreciate it. There are very few podcasts with four figures of ratings, and I think that we can get there. And with that, let's dive into my conversation with Josh Pigford. You may remember him from an episode I was within the past couple of months where we talked about him selling Bear Metrics for $4.7 million. And he dug through all the details of that. And, you know, he'd run Bear Metrics for, for years and hired up to up to 12 people. And so he has a lot of thoughts on, on these topics we're going to talk about today. I had a great time chatting with Josh. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Josh Pigford, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Rob. Why is your Twitter handle not your first and then your last name, Josh Pigford? It's S.H. Pigford, and I've always wondered about that. Yeah, so that the handle comes from instant messenger days where it's just, I, I think I was just like 19-year-old Josh. It was one of those things you could you would have your instant messenger handle. So like I had Josh Pigford, just you know, a single word, but you could change the spacing. Like the you could put spaces and capitalization and change that stuff and it wouldn't change the name because I was it was really funny. I changed it to Joe Spigford one day. And then the Spigford part, like people just started calling me Spigford in like real life. <laughs> so so it kind of stuck. And and it was easy to get like nobody's got that handle at all. No, but nobody's got Josh Pigford either, but like it's just it's a little bit shorter and it's a little bit more unique than just my name. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Pickford's not a common last name, so I wasn't imagining you were using People are already going to butcher, butcher the spelling, but so it's like I might as well just make it more difficult. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, Whew, well, that's settled, and I feel better about that. I Good. totally, <laughs> it's been bothering me. I woke up at 3 in the morning last night <laughs> thinking about it for some reason. Well, that's sweet. Uh, that's, cu- that's cute so that you're thinking about thinking me I was thinking about sleep. you. Right. Yeah, totally. So I, I got to bust your chops, man. So we're going to answer questions, We I, I promise, but... You and I on the last show, we were chatting. It was nice and calm. And I said, good, if I only have one piece of advice for you, Josh, it's like, take six months off. Don't rush into anything else. And you yourself were like, man, I just don't know. I've been making money in software for 15 years. I don't know that I ever want to do it again. And then record scratch. And suddenly, like within a week of that episode, I I see you tweeting, hey, I'm building software again. And for folks who want to see it, it's at maybe.finance. Or actually, it's a company.maybe.co. It's maybe.co, actually. It's just you can just go to maybe.co, yeah. Maybe.co. And maybe is modern financial and retirement planning. You have the best MVP ever. It is literally a Notion document. What the hell is going on, dude? You you said you weren't going to do know. it. Yeah. What? No. What happened? No, I'm curious to hear this story. Yes. Yeah, so I have an addiction to building things. We all do. I yes. know. So this actually, you know, we we talked a little bit about this on that previous episode about like a financial advisor, and I can't remember if we talked about it, if it got made the episode or if we were just as like, this was after the fact or something, but like the whole financial advisor taking X percentage of the like assets that they manage and like that costing me ultimately like $2 million over the course of the next like 40 or 50 years. And so then that like jumped into me like managing it myself. And then it was like, okay, the more I started reaching out to other founders who had had exits and being like, how are you managing all your money? And they'd be like, man, it's stupid. Excel spreadsheets. Or like, I try to use this thing, but it's terrible. Or like, I hey, I just don't even do anything with it because it's like, there's no good way for me to, to do this. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to build something myself. And it feels like the kind of thing where I, it was one of those like opportunities. It feels like there's like an opportunity from a market perspective where investing's become a lot more democratized. 
people want to have a better handle on their finances differently than say like our parents who were optimizing for retirement. And like, now I would say most people are not optimizing for retirement. They're optimizing for like, how can I like do the things I want to do now and not wait till I'm like 60 or 70. I think that software can handle can like answer the what if questions or like the maybe like the whole name maybe sort of revolves around like you asking yourself like, hey, maybe I like open a coffee shop or maybe I take an international trip. Maybe I buy my dream house like and then we answer that how that's possible or show you how that's possible. Got it. And I have a lot of thoughts on it because I'm concerned that you and I care about our personal finances. I'm like a nerd about it. And then, you know, I think it sounds like you kind of always have, but really once you had more wealth after selling, uh, you know, selling bare metrics, you obviously have a, a concern about it. It doesn't feel to me like the average person does. So I think the average person has been like, culturally speaking, we're taught, okay, you work, put money into retirement plan, you bust it for the next 30 years, and then you can retire, right? Like that's the, that's the mindset. And I don't think that that's necessarily what everybody has to do. I think there's ways around that when, when you properly plan, right? Like I'm not telling, like maybe isn't going to like all of a sudden give you a million dollars, right? But in, in the same way that like a financial advisor can help you or would help you have a plan, we can bypass, maybe it's like replacing the financial advisor. Uh-oh. See, I was hoping that you were building a tool for financial advisors because when I think about building a, like a personal finance product and I think about selling B2B, I'm like, okay, I can get behind that. But if you're talking about going B2C, can I just tell you, please don't? Please don't do that. Yeah, no, well, in the same way that you told me to not start anything after into, you know, six months and I'm doing it anyways, uh, same, same thing. It's very much on no. purpose. Yeah, That's right. So, but I mean, that's not to say like, uh, you know, part of this comes out of the fact that I was playing around with the financial advisor software that our financial advisor was using and it's, and it is truly terrible. So like, that's not to say that, you know, six months into this, I'm like, okay, pivot, whatever. Like maybe this does turn into some sort of B2B to play. But like, I also think the whole financial advising world is sort of also having a big sort of overhaul new sort of fresh financial advisors aren't billing in the same way that previous ones were. And so like, there's just this, there's all sorts of stuff that's happening in the finance space, I guess, or at least personal finance. So this is me sort of like getting my foot in the door and figuring out the best way to sort of tackle that. Yeah, I could see that. And you and I have known each other long enough. You know, I'm, it's lighthearted ribbing and I'm obviously root, rooting for you. Sure. Um, so In reality, like it's a good thing to have people like question what you're doing, right? <laughs> right. And that's the thing is, you know, you shot the gap with, with bare metrics. You got in early in the Stripe ecosystem. It was a change that was happening where we had all these payment gateways and it was a nightmare, to be honest. And, and Stripe fixed that and a bunch of us started using it, a bunch of us being SaaS founders. And we all wrote, built custom dashboards, which is what I was doing at the time. And you came in and saw that need and boom, you know, within weeks, like everything was going. This could be that case again, or it could not be. Like you're, you're trying to hit a trend that you think is happening. Because I think if you tried to build this, let's say even five years ago, I just don't think anyone cares. It wouldn't happen. No. Right. And, and I think, but I do think there, especially with millennials and folks who are, you know, younger than you and I, to be honest, they do think about finances in a different way. That's your big risk here. You know, you can build the software, you know, you can build, you know, you can do all the things that the risk is, are you going to hit a movement as it's happening? And that, that's really, I think the gamble here. I think with bare metrics, one of the things that I felt was sort of this indicator that something was ripe for being built in the software space was that everybody was doing like custom stuff, either like actually programming their own stuff or doing it in spreadsheets, right? Like everybody was hacking together tools. And now there's, you know, software has mostly uh, like just kicked that to the curb. So that's also the case in this like personal finance world where when I talk to people like, well, how do you like manage your investments or your finances in general, like outside of just basic budgeting, which this is not a budgeting app at all. Outside of that, everybody's using spreadsheets. Yep. Google sheets for me. Exactly. Right. So it's, you know, this is one of those cases where like if the timing feels right and there's these clear indicators that people want something because they're building their own, they're hacking together their own tools to make it happen. And so that's where it's like the timing part Instead of waiting, you know, another six months or doing this in a couple of years, the timing feels feels right on, on that. So that's why I, I sort of begrudgingly jumped into it. 
Yeah, I, th- I mean, I w- obviously wish you, you know, the best and I'm going to be um, cheering you along from the sidelines. I had two friends who sold businesses and then years apart and jumped back into something really quick, like within weeks, you know, where they were inspired. One of them wound up regret, well, they both wound up regretting it for different reasons, but one of them burned out and he was like, I was still burned out and I didn't recover and all that. So my hope is that, because you had a few months off, right? I mean, you had you had four or five months off, I think. That's right. Like I only took six months off after leaving Drip before diving. Well, it wasn't even six months actually, if you want to know the truth. So yeah, oh, I mean, oops. Yes, it was definitely six uh-huh. months. So anyway, sir, um, maybe.co, if folks want to follow along, you have links to, to all the stuff and I'm super excited to see what you build. Thanks, man. All right, let's dive into listener questions today. We have some really good ones. Our first one is about annual raises. And this author or the question asker, he writes in quite a bit, actually, um, he has to be remain anonymous, um, but he's doing very well. And I believe, I think he sent me another email and I believe they've just hit a million ARR to give you a, you know, an idea of the size of his business. So mad props to anonymous question asker. His question is about annual raises. And he says, when we were a company of three to five people, pay raises were easy to figure out on a case by case basis. But as we grow, that's getting harder. What rules should we put in place so that there are reasonable expectations on all sides? And this is a question that I would not have had an answer to until we got acquired. Because when we were, you know, eight full time plus two contractors, it was all case by case. And when we were acquired by Lead Pages, which was 170 people at the time, they had all of this figured out. And that is actually like one of the advantages, I think, of seeing both sides, you know, basically working in a venture funded company. They had 38 million in venture, 170 people. And I, I got to see way down the line of what Drip maybe was going to be 10 years from now. So I will weigh in after I hear your thoughts, because at Bear Metrics, how large did you guys get team wise? I think the largest is 12. Okay. And how did you think about annual pay raises? Did you do it off the cuff on a case by case or did you have some standards? Yeah. So this was, this was um, the thing that kept me up at night the most probably on a regular basis was I never really loved how we handled this stuff. So we sold at the end of last of 2020 at the beginning of 2020, like January ish, I had just started like really hashing out how we would not just raises, but actually compensation. Like how can we standardize compensation so that it's a doesn't require negotiating and B is sort of repeatable and as fair as this can be. There will always be some sort of disagreement probably between what I think someone should get compensated and what that same person thinks as far as skill levels and whatnot, but trying to standardize that stuff. And the biggest help for me on how to figure out that stuff was Buffer's salary formula. And what they do, like we didn't use their exact formula. However, what that led me to checking out was that I had not really researched before was Radford. So they have like the Radford surveys where they like sort of compensation surveys that they run. And it costs a few thousand bucks to get access to it. But this lets you standardize base level compensation. And then what you do is like you take the base level compensation and then you have these different sort of buckets for essentially like how someone moves up in the company. But it's like different ways to sort of figure out what someone's skill level is or how they've improved. And so you do basically biannual or annual sort of performance reviews and then talk directly with the employee about, you know, what do you, where do you think you are on this sort of scale? Here's where I think you are. Here's how you can move up, et cetera. And then that is what influences your salary and not this sort of like, well, you always get a 5% raise every year or whatever. Like you get a raise by becoming like better at your job versus getting a raise just because you've existed at the company for a while. Yeah, and we'll we'll try to find that article, or we will find that article on Buffer's site and link to it in the show notes. When we were small, I remember, I mean, we were like four or five people, I remember saying to a new hire, like, we don't do annual reviews because... I hate annual reviews, you know, or something. <laughs> right. And it, which is which is fine to say at five people. When you're at a hundred people, you can't. It just doesn't. You know what I mean? It just, you, and you can make annual reviews not suck. You can make them to where it is a, where it's not so. I don't know, so formal and and I don't. I think of like Microsoft, IBM, you know, Fortune 500 company doing it, and and it's like you don't have to do it that way. But so here's what I saw and what I what I admired about what they did at. At Lead Pages, and then of course at, at you know now at Drip, now that you know Lead Pages is is no longer part of the company. 
the folks were hired and jobs were posted based on a market rate salary. And the HR folks did salary surveys and they had paid for this expensive software. My salary surveys involved me going to Google and typing in a location and, and a role. Or if it's, it's remote, then I try to just wing it. But Glassdoor and salary.com usually come up. So I have some idea of where the market rate is. Here's the thing. You can get people lower than market rate if you have advantages. We used to have advantages as bootstrappers because you, you would say, we're a super small team and you're going to make a big impact on the product. You're really going to love your job and you can be fully remote and work from anywhere. Well, that last one <laughs> has been removed recently because everyone's remote. My hope is that it does come back because I do think some bootstrappers are having harder and harder times finding people at reasonable prices, reasonable salaries, because there are companies, you know, now that all of Silicon Valley and most of the Fortune 5000 is hiring remote, they can pay a lot more, bottom line. So it is harder. So if you're paying below market, like someone really either needs to have stock options or some other advantage that makes it worthwhile for them to do that, because over the long term, no one is going to work for your company for years for below market rate for no other reason, right? What they did that was interesting too is Every year someone worked, they would rerun the salary survey because sometimes, let's say you hire a senior developer in Minneapolis or a senior designer, right? And, and that role is maybe 110,000. But it, within a year, that role may jump to 130. Like it's possible that Target, you know, and Best Buy and General Mills and a bunch of the other Fortune 500 companies here in town have hired a bunch of people and raised that rate. So they would actually adjust to market, give or take, which again, it's not when you're five people or 10 people, I don't know that you have to do all this, but you probably should keep an eye on it because if you don't, people will look at other jobs. They know it's like, it's like the price of your house. You know how you don't always check the price of your house, but you just kind of know how much it's worth. You know, like we all do. I think that's similar with salaries. It's like, I don't have to really Google what a senior software engineer makes in town if I'm a senior software engineer in town. I, I kind of know what my friends are making and you figure it out. So that was an interesting thing they did. Now they were venture funded. They had the budget to do that. So if you're bootstrapped, maybe, maybe you don't fully have the ability, but that was a thing. And then in terms of annual raises, it was three to 5% based on performance. And if you were doing amazing, you got a 5%, that was just the cost of living raise, right? And if you were getting three or percent, you needed feedback, just like you said. You're only getting three and here's why. And hopefully this is not, the annual review should not be breaking them this news. Like you should have had this conversation before that of like, hey, here's where you're not, you know, performing up to the level or here's where I want you to exceed this to actually get that full 5%. So any other thoughts on that? No, I think that's spot on. I think like, it's not just about you figuring out, is this person performing? Like it's also about, they're not going to be happy if they look back over the past year and are like, oh, I haven't actually improved right? Or like, I'm not better at being an engineer or like customer support rep or whatever it is that they also want to be better at their job than they were a year before. And they should be rewarded for that by, you know, getting paid more. But if they're not, then like you need to, you need to be able to tell them how to fix that. And some people are really great at like realizing, okay, I am falling down on the job here. Here's how I need to fix it. Other people have no clue. They have zero self-awareness and that's, you can fix that by like, helping them see it, but you have to give them feedback and there has to be this sort of like set opportunity via say an, an annual review to like talk about that stuff. That's right. And the alternative to this, because this is sounds complicated, like it's going to keep you up at night and it is complicated and it does keep you up at night. It's hard. And the alternative is I watch folks like Rand Fishkin, who's launched Spark Toro and they're doing plenty of revenue to hire as many people as they want and they have no employees. They only hire contractors and consultants because they don't want to deal with this aspect of it. And that's your trade-off, right? You might maybe pay a little more per hour. Maybe people uh, wind up taking a job or, or they don't have time for you or they're freelancers or whatever. But going the consulting route is not a terrible way to go, especially if you can afford it because it's purely performance-based. If you want to hire a marketer, full-time W-2, and they're not performing, I feel like as the founder slash CEO, like it's kind of your marketing manager, whatever, like it's kind of your job, like you're saying to like bring them up to, to speed and, uh, and well, why aren't you performing? Let me help you do that. And let me help you with personal growth and let me help you with business growth. If you hire a consultant for a three month contract or six month contract and they don't perform, you let them go and you find someone who will. And it's a really interesting, it's an interesting trade off for people, people should think about. All right, next question. This question is from Steve McLeod, and he is the host of the Bootstrapped.fm podcast. He says, I recently made a substantial increase to the prices of my B2B SaaS. It's called Feature Upvote. Instead of a flat $49 a month, I now have three tiers, $49, $99, and $249. Existing customers stay at the old price. 
I just implemented these prices without any announcement. Was that a mistake or a lost opportunity? Should I have written an informational blog post about it? If so, what's a good way to explain a large price increase? What do you think, sir? So to his questions, was this was that a mistake to not post about it? No. Like, that'd be a really weird thing to write a blog post about. I think uh, as the owner or developer or whatever of your own company, like, you think people care and look at your pricing and, like, see how they've changed their prices or whatever. Like, nobody cares. Literally no one cares. Like, they're, if they're using your software already and, you know, you're not raising the price for them, then they, again, they don't care. And if they weren't using your software, they really you know, there's a handful of people who maybe have been shopping and had seen the price, but like a blog post probably won't be seen by them, nor will it help them. So no, there's, I don't think there's anything to say about price increases or or changes at all. And the reality is you should be testing and changing prices all the time to, to be figuring out, you know, what's the optimal price point? What are people willing to pay for? And there's no need to write anything every time you like test out some new pricing. I think I'm on the same page with you. I I can see there was a one time where I increased pricing. Now, I think we did it both on Drip, and this is when I increased pricing, not when the subsequent owner did and everything blew up. It was, there were at least two times, probably three, where we did pricing overhauls, you know, in the, during the time that we owned it. And then I did this with Hitail as well. Here's the thing. If you're going to raise prices, people are evaluating the software, and they're doing a trial, or they're looking at it, and suddenly you raise prices one day, and they come back the next day and say, hey, Your old pricing used to be this. I was about to sign up. You're probably, the way I would do it is be like, cool, I'll just honor that. Like, I'll give you the old pricing just because it doesn't matter to me. Uh, Since I'm going to do that anyways, before we raised pricing, we did send out an email to anyone on our marketing list and probably did a tweet or something. We, I don't believe we did a blog post, but we, we sent it because that's, again, that sticks on your, like you said, no one cares and it doesn't need to stay on your site forever. But for us, it was a promotion and it was like, hey, pricing is going to go up next week and it's going to double or whatever it's going to do. But if you sign up now, we will honor the old pricing. You know, we will essentially grandfather folks. You know, not forever. We didn't commit to that, but we did say, you know, for the foreseeable future. And it did get a, a, a big rush of trials of people trying to get in under that wire. Now, did I ever go back and analyze and figure out how many stayed around and how many did? I did not. But I do remember having a good growth month. So I, I'm not saying that, that you should do that all the time either, though, because we didn't do it every time. And there were certain factors that we wanted to weigh in. Sometimes, like you said, we just wanted to test and play around. And we didn't want to be so public about it because we wanted to be able to roll it back if it was a disaster, right? And so in that case, we didn't do the big promotion. There was a... That's probably two years ago or something, where we were on our company-wide retreat for Bear Metrics, and uh, one morning I was like, guys, what if we just literally doubled our prices? Like, did nothing except take every price and multiply it times two on the marketing site. Let's try it. And so, like, by that afternoon, like, we had, we were, like, A-B testing, doubling our prices for zero added benefit. Again, this is not for existing customers, right? And so, like, like, it would have been silly for us to write a blog post because a month later, like we rolled that back, like where we stopped running that AB test. I think it's just, you should always be testing out different prices and seeing what sticks and what doesn't stick. And, and there's, there's no need to like make a big to do about it, except for in your case, when you can use it to your advantage of uh, like a mar- marketing opportunity. Right. Before I announced it, I was pretty confident that we that it was going to work and that we were going to stick with it and all that. That's the thing. I agree with you. More founders should be messing with pricing constantly and testing. It's just so scary to do so. I remember how terrifying it was to think I could just decimate my funnel. And you just have to, you just have to push through it. You know, that's where having like when folks come into the, the tiny seed batches within the first few weeks, I mean, that's the biggest lever in SaaS, right? Is is pricing. You know, you don't need to build new features, you don't need to get more leads. You can double growth if you were to double pricing and and keep the same conversion. And so we do talk through a lot of price increases to to early founders in in tiny seed and in fact usually within the first couple of calls I will do a, a a call for hand raises and say who on this call thinks they're pri- they're either underpriced or they're mispriced, you know, their value metrics off. And usually it's been about 70%, 80% who just feel like they're they have a gut feel their pricing's off but they don't really know why and so then we do a bunch of deep dives and analyze and chat chat them through. So pricing it's no fun, but you gotta gotta deal with it. All right, next question is from Adam at paidmembersapp.com. He's asking about free or discounted plans in exchange for branding. He says, what do you think of a discounted tier that includes branding? I.e., my customer will get my brand at the bottom of emails sent from my app to their customers. Fairly unobtrusive, but still present 
and they would have to upgrade to remove the branding. So I'm going to cut in right here and I'm going to say, this is fairly common, like Drip had Powered by Drip on the widget, MailChimp on their free plan, I believe. There's probably, a, I think there's a Powered by MailChimp badge at the bottom of the emails, e-signature apps, you know, like a doc sketch back to his email. If my main plan is $49, I was considering offering a $29 plan, which shows branding, given that I am essentially offering a discount in exchange for the customer providing marketing about my SaaS. Does this seem like a valuable enough trade-off to be okay with people being on the less expensive plan forever? I was going to add a higher transaction fee to move customers up to my higher plan, but then I thought maybe just having someone on a lower plan is fine if I get a lot of clicks from the branded emails or footers links on their website. How valuable in general is having branding like this? Is it worth the trade-off of lower MRR from the customer? You have any thoughts? Yes. I think there's a few ways to tackle this. On a on the base level, should I should I offer a lower price plan and the only difference is adding branding? No. So instead, I think of it this way: someone who's that price conscious that they're like, I'm gonna save 20 bucks so that I can remove the branding, probably isn't going to send you anything anyways. Like they're too small or too early in business or whatever for whatever, wherever they're including a link, like nobody's going to see it. So it doesn't matter. However, what you'll typically see is this called like white label or like they'll have like a white label plan where you actually pay a lot more to remove the branding. So basically like all your lower plans, whether that's a 29, 49, 99, whatever, have branding by default, then offer a $100, $200 a month plan that removes branding in addition to other things. Like, I don't think you can do pricing just to remove branding. You're not going to really see that big of a difference. But having that grouped into a higher paying plan, I think can sort of push people over the edge to be like, okay, sure, I'll pay the extra 50 bucks a month so that I can also remove the branding in addition to getting all this other stuff. But I think if you're going to do the the branding bit, like include it on all your, your sub $100 a month plans by default and then pay a lot more to remove it. I would agree with that. I don't think branding should be the only difference. And in fact, back with Drip, we had a Powered by Drip link in our email capture widget that people could put on their site. And our lowest plan was 49 and that included the link. You couldn't shut it off. And at the 99 plan, you got whatever it was, double the subscribers and some other integrations and you could turn off the Powered by Drip link. In the early days, we had some folks... I mean, this is when we're at 200, 300 customers, you know, um, versus later when we're, you know, whatever, 10x, 20x that. In the early days, there were some people that complained about it at 49. And I believe it was so, it was so small though, that we just added a little checkbox in the admin dashboard. And it was like, we just added 20 bucks. It was like, well, you pay 20 bucks to remove it. Like if it bothers you that much, be on the 69. And it worked. But again, it was like, most people didn't care. And most people didn't ask. The big thing I would say to Adam, who's thinking about this is, is there a way to test this without messing around with pricing? Because what you want to test here is viral loop, is the virality, right? There's a viral coefficient. You, you can Google this. I won't go through it here. But basically, if every one of your customers refers another customer within one month, that's like an amazing viral loop for B2B SaaS, right? That would be off the charts. And that's really what you want to test is how many click-throughs do you get? How many trial signups or customers do you get? And so I would sit down and think, is there is there a way to test this? Maybe as of tomorrow, everyone who signs up for your main $49 plan, which is your main plan you have today, as of tomorrow, the branding just shows up and see if anyone notices and if anyone complains and measure that for the next couple months. It's pretty easy. You'll see how many customers have it, how many links and how many trials, and you'll quickly be able to calculate is any of this worth it? Because I do think it depends on your customer base, their reach, you know, to your point, if they have 20 website visitors a month, it's not going to help. If they have 500,000 website visitors a month, there's probably going to be enough traffic to make it worth. And so it's, that's, that's where it is. I remember with us, we did look at it. We put Google UTM params on the Powered by Link and we measured it. And I remember it being, it was worth having it, but it wasn't like some groundbreaking marketing channel. Like the business wasn't going to grow on autopilot purely with the viral loop, but I remember it was worth it enough to keep it around. But that's my experience, right? And I, you know, it depends on a lot of things. If you think about now versus five plus years ago, I think it used to be really popular, especially with like analytics tools, especially thinking about Mixpanel doing this, where if you put like a little Mixpanel, tiny little graphic in the footer of your site or whatever, they would give you an extra 100,000 sessions or whatever, like for their free plan. And that used to be more common, I think, but now 
from a technology perspective, like people just don't have websites as much anymore. So there's more just app based stuff and like these things that a lot of people have read or even seen in the past five to 10 years aren't as applicable just based on like the landscape now. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you though. The discount, I mean, it's like, it's complicated, but I don't, I wouldn't overthink this, I think is, is the bottom line. I don't think it's such a big deal that you need to spend a bunch of time on it. I would just get out and test it and see what happens. I, and I also think it's, it's to some extent, if anything, it's more about being a branding play for yourself where it's like, man, I'm seeing this little widget everywhere. Like, what is that? And it's less, I think Intercom's a big one, where, but they've, their icon itself in the little chat bubble is probably what people know more than a link that they've seen. And so I think if you're going to do it, make it a branding play in the same way that you'd be advertising or something. Think of it more that way instead of like, how can I get people to pay me more? I don't know, there's lots of ways to think about it. And I don't think there's any really right or wrong answer there. So thanks for that question. I hope that was helpful. Our next question is a long one. I'm gonna have to summarize some pieces of it. And he asked to remain anonymous. He said, I'm the co-founder and CTO of a tool that makes workshop planning easy. We're a mostly bootstrapped, fully remote business. And since we achieved product market fit in early 2018, we've had steady 7% month over month MRR growth, which is yeah, not bad for three years. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, I mean, it depends on where they started from. But he says, overall, we still consider the business quite stable. And we have a lot of ideas on how to improve the business, but we need more resources. We need more hands. So we want to grow our team. About a year and a half ago, we started growing the team and went from two co-founders to our current team of six. We've realized we need to continue on the process of hiring as our backlog is ever increasing. And here comes the core of my question. Any advice on how to find good people that are a fit for working in small startups, meaning they are good at managing themselves, wearing many hats, and finding and learning new ways of doing something? There are a couple of challenges. First of all, is there a good place to find such people? Second, how do you identify the versatility of skills and the small startup fit? I have a feeling most people tend to emphasize few specialties in their resumes, so they may seem more professional rather than being all over the place. But is there something specific you look for? Are these kind of people too busy building their own startups? No, I don't, I don't think they are. Josh, sir, you and I have hired many people. I've hired them for big companies and for small startups, and I know, you, you know you've, you've hired for yourself and at small companies. What do you think of his question? So one thing, I think you, you skimmed over this in his email, but there was one part where he said, he said, I'm sure he'd said that they had hired six people. And he says, like, I'm sure by now our overall performance as a company has increased, but there are moments when it feels like it would just be easier to do all the work myself. And I get that feeling for sure. But I think he's probably downplaying that their overall performance as a company has increased. And I think when it comes to finding good people, you have to find people who you know will basically free you up to do other things that you're sort of specialized at. But I think the way that you find people, you know, he's correct that you, you want to find people who can do lots of things or wear many hats. And for us, like one of the big indicators to me of someone being good at wearing lots of hats were people who were self-employed before joining the company. So I, I optimized for finding like those kind of people or at least wanting to push through the interview process a lot more or people who were freelancers because like running your own business, even if it's a, as a freelance business, like you are still wearing many hats to, to pull that off, right? So that was always like a, a very quick indicator to me. It was like, have you ever been self-employed? Was a question that I would ask that I thought was pretty crucial to finding if somebody is capable of self-managing and doing lots of things and, and not thinking, well, I'm only the like JavaScript, mobile, whatever, like very specific, anybody who's like hyper-focused, on a specific job likely wouldn't be a good fit in an early stage because they're optimizing for being the very greatest at a very specific thing. And that's not what you need in those sort of early small team days. Yeah. We used to put the phrase of like, not my job in quotes is not something you hear anyone on our team say that was in the job description, you know, and it was just a way of like, yeah, we kind of, we wear a lot of hats. I think to address his first question is where do you find such people? I don't think they're all busy building their own startups. A lot of people want the experience of working on a successful one. And so I, I definitely think that back to like in-person events, like if you come to microconfs or you find, you know, whatever else type of events, meetups and such in your city, I do think that networking is, is a piece of it. You know, it's getting to know other people. Microconf Connect is another example, right? That's an online thing with about 2,000 founders and aspiring founders. And there's a jobs and hiring channel and people have hired other people in the Connect 
community who are still, you know, working the day job and doing stuff on the side. There is also, there's some pretty good job boards for this. So weworkremotely.com, which was started by Basecamp and, and later sold, but it's still up and running. And I, it's, it's, it is startup-minded, small team, remote people. Authenticjobs.com is one that I used back in the day. I believe they're still, you know, good. And uh, dynamitejobs.com from Tropical MBA guys. RemoteOK.io. Those are kind of the four that I know about. And there's one called Parachute List, ParachuteList.com, which I believe was launched right as COVID happened and there were a bunch of layoffs. And so I don't know how accurate Parachute List still is, but the other four is certainly places I would be thinking about posting. And then identifying the versatility of skills, that was always a big question that I had If we were going to hire someone who was currently working at a big company, I wanted them to really, really not like working at the big company. If they enjoyed that, they were not a fit because that shows that they are, like you said, very, they probably have a very specific job role and they like all the answers. You know, they like having an HR department you can go to for that, which isn't going to be at a six person company, you know, and they like to go to procurement to buy their laptop. And (laughs) it's like, nope, not going to have that. You know, all this stuff we just kind of have to handle. You just kind of have to do it. So if it was someone at a big company who really didn't like it, or if they had a lot of prior experience at small companies, or like you said, you know, freelancers running their own business was, was a thing. There was a good fit that I found, which was someone who had worked at like a startup or on their own, then had gone to work for a big company and just hated it. And they were trying to get out of it and they were trying to go back. And so they had experience doing both. And that showed me, they thought the grass was greener because big companies typically pay more. And we, we call, call that combat pay where it's, you're getting paid because your job sucks. You're getting paid more. Right. And, and again, a fortune 500 company will probably pay 20%, 30% more than, than my bootstrap software company can pay, but your job sucks and you don't enjoy it. So that's the trade-off that folks have to make. This is less um, applicable now, or it's probably not as good of a filter, but obviously as a remote company, we wanted people who were comfortable work. They had to, they were going to work remotely, but people who had already been working remotely, similar sort of skill set I found as someone who was a freelancer in that they had already made the decision to work from home. And so they were already very good at managing themselves. Like they didn't have to be in an office you know, sort of managed by someone walking around or like looking busy or whatever. That's less the case now, I think. But anybody who's been, say, if if they've been working from home for a long time, even if they were working for another company, chances are they're pretty good at managing themselves to begin with. That's a really good point because when I was hiring, let's say 10 years ago, trying to find people who had a work from home experience was really hard. And nowadays, you know, let's say barring COVID, let's say a year ago, pre-COVID, it was a lot easier to find folks. And so I do think that's probably a minimum requirement. The folks I've seen who try to transition from working in an office to working from home usually have a pretty rough transition. And that would be a, I would say at least a yellow flag for me if they didn't have, you know, pre-COVID uh, work from home experience. He added two additional questions in his PS, and I think we'll answer these and then wrap for the day. He said, any advice on full-time versus contract developers when we're trying to ensure continuity? So far, we have only hired full-time. I'll let you take a crack at this one first. I I get the feeling of wanting someone full-time. That person sort of by default probably a little more invested in sort of the long-term well-being of the company. But I think there are a number of times where I'd wanted to hire full-time, but then I was like, "Let, let me just try contracting with this person for a couple of months and see where we go. And a lot of times those would not work out, not because the person was bad at it, but because that work that I thought I was hiring them for, there wasn't enough of it there in the way that I thought there was going to be. Like this happened a lot with like data science roles where I was like, well, we definitely need somebody who can like do data science-y things. And then like I would hire someone as a contractor and then it'd be like, well, I, I don't know what else to give you to do here. So having someone who can contract for say three to six months with knowing that they're available to hire full-time to me is sort of the best of both worlds there where you get to sort of, you both get to try it out and make sure that there's a good fit, but you also aren't asking them to go quit their job somewhere to potentially come on board full-time when you don't have enough work for them. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think in their early days, I certainly was all contractors because I just didn't have confidence in revenue to be able to, you know, hire people full time. But, you know, the question asker is not in that situation, right? They have a business that's been growing 7% for three years. So at that point, if I truly am just looking at developers, 
I lean towards hiring full time because I love if there if it's just like we need another Rails developer or we need a Rails slash DevOps developer or you know it's someone that I know there is absolutely full time work available for them and we can just crank out features more or get there faster. I like full time because there's focus. There's, you know, two-way loyalty. I think like we'll take care of you. You kind of watch have our back. There's ownership. You know, even if it's not actual true equity, it's like there's that mental ownership of like, I work here. This is my company. I have pride in it versus I'm a hired gun. And so I, I lean towards that direction if you're going to build out a dev team. I, I like having camaraderie among the developers. I like, you know, because at certain times it does feel, I mean, when the servers go down or like shit's hitting the fan, it's nice to have that team that is cohesive, you know, and has like a really good way of working together and a lot of respect for each other. And I feel like ensuring continuity is a phrase that he used. And so I do lean towards that. But again, if I was doing 10K a month, (laughs) barely paying my bills, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out and do that right away. You mentioned developers specifically. I think it depends on the role, but specifically with developers, there can be a very long onboarding sort of run up to them being really productive. So it's hard to, to bring in someone who can just like jump in. A back-end engineer, especially if you've got a pretty complex product, it could take them three plus months before they're contributing something that's making a business impact. And it, it is hard to do that on a contract basis. And of course, the flip side of that is something I said earlier, which is the more W2 folks you have, the more of them you have to manage and do pay raises and do annual reviews and check in with them once a week, once a month. And there's complexities there. But see, I've felt like managing developers specifically, I guess maybe I've gotten good at it, maybe being a developer, I don't know what it is, but I don't feel like it's that hard. And I do like, since we are, I mean, our product is software and it's like, I want the folks building that to be on the team. But if I'm going to look at marketing, sales or operations or any of that stuff, I would be much more likely to consider, you know, having contractors or consultants in those roles. Last question of the day, still from the the same asker, it's in his PS. He says, using recruiters, are they actually good at finding people? Have you used recruiters ever, Josh? I have not. Not pass. Well, well, not like an individual recruiter. I've used a few sites where it's like, put in what you want, and then the site guarantees that you'll get X number of applicants or something, but not not an individual going out and doing recruiting for us, no. Yeah, so I had experience with recruiters, let's say 15 plus years ago, and they when I was still a developer, it was almost 20 actually, and I was still a developer, and they would find me, and they're contingency recruiters, and they were, I felt like they didn't know what they were talking about. They were not good at it. They took 15% of my first year salary. It was, you know, they had, they didn't take it from me. They took it from the, you know, the company, the hiring company. So my sense of recruiters at that point was very negative. So then as I built Drip, in the early days, I did all the hiring, which was a mistake because I spent way too much time on it and took way too much headspace. Once we were acquired, they had two or three full-time recruiters. I think it was two full-time recruiters on staff. And I resisted allowing the recruiters to kind of get into the process because I was like, no, 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 I know how to do this best. I'm the founder, right? I'm the CEO. And you know what? I was wrong. And the recruiters at Lead Pages and then Drip were phenomenal. And they took so much like headache off of my plate. And they would post the jobs, they would do the initial scan of the resumes, narrow it down based on criteria we talked about. We would work on the job description together, they'd post it, and then they would filter and they would do an initial phone screen, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. They handled negotiation, they handled so much stuff. I will never go back. You know, there's certain things that I learned that I just won't go back on. But they were, they were in-house, right? They're full-time W-2. So then after... You know, I left Drip and we had to hire for uh, our first role. It was when we hired Tracy, who's the program manager at Tiny Seed. I contacted a recruiter friend of mine who does recruiting as a day job. And I said, could I pay you, <laughs> you know, a few thousand dollars to basically do all of that stuff for me? Like just as, as a side gig for you, right? So it's some income for you and I know that you're good at this. And that's what happened. And it was absolutely worth it. So that's been my new mindset is if I'm going to hire, I want to find a recruiter who is willing to do that kind of thing, like a flat fee 
engagement. And I'm encouraging actually tiny C companies to do this now. And again, you don't lose control of your hiring process. You just hand off the stuff that you don't need to do, which is posting to all those job boards that I just said and monitoring that and filtering from 100 down to 10 resumes, which you know we can all do, but you shouldn't be doing it as the founder, right? As a CEO. And so I obviously am not going to give out the name of the person who I've used because they'll get overwhelmed and they do it on the side. But dynamitejobs.com, who I've already mentioned from Tropical MBA, folks, Dan and Ian, they actually do some of this. And I've been sending some tiny seed founders to them to where it's, you know, I mean, they, they publish the rates on their side. It's like 4,500 bucks. It's a flat fee and it, you know, will take that off your plate. Again, if you're a bootstrapper, you're hiring for your first role, you may not have that much money, right? But if budget allows, yes, I absolutely think that finding a reputable recruiter usually, I mean, this is where I would ask in MicroConf Connect, right? Or, or another, you know, a community or a network on Twitter, or whatever, who has used a recruiter that, charges three to five grand as a flat fee and will help me find this person in any country and is knowledgeable in this and that. So that's, that's my current advice and current thinking on that. You mentioned having somebody who's doing the, like posting the job boards and sort of filtering things down. I did have an administrative assistant at Bear Metrics who would do that kind of stuff. So I do think like if you've got someone who, who can just manage the part where you're, you know, filtering things down or doing the stuff that, doesn't require your brain who's like trying to understand culture fit. There's a lot of people who can actually handle a lot of the sort of administrative minutia of hiring that that takes up all your time. Yeah. Did your admin assistant, uh, did he or she also do initial like screening calls and do salary negotiation, that kind of stuff? No, she would not do that. Though we very rarely did screening call. Like we didn't have to do calls that much. I, I did most, as much as I could via text anyways, and she could, she would handle all that stuff. So there you have it. Those are our questions for today, sir. Thanks for taking a few minutes and hanging out with me. I, I think I had a lot of fun on this episode. Yeah, man. This was fun. Yeah. So you're SH Pigford on the Twitters and of course, maybe.co if folks want to keep up with your, what you're doing. Awesome. Well, I look forward to having you back, man. You've been on the show a couple of times, but I feel like I should have you back more often, I think. Yeah. Anytime. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. Thanks, Rob. Thanks again to Josh for coming on the show and thank you for listening this week and I'll be back in your earbuds again next Tuesday morning.